Can you hold over your Okay. Can you see it? Okay. 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 Got it. it I didn't know. I just needed to do an event and then it went live. It says it's live. It says it's live. Okay, perfect. That's okay, great. Yeah. A new event. Yeah. And it's starting live and she can see it. And it's through Jordan Red Rose. Yeah. You have a supervisor? I 
Um, please go to introduce uh, Jordan Borbaugh for her thesis seminar. I met Jordan uh, when she joined the graduate program uh, coming from the University of Missouri. In her first, in her first year here, uh, she and I had two classes together, uh, small student seminars where those students do all the talking. From those experiences, um, it was clear that Jordan was smart, that she had an instinct for interesting science, and that she had drive and enormous energy. All qualities necessary to do good science. But people who do science long enough learn that those talents may be the entrance to it, but they're not enough. And they aren't everything. Especially for young people just starting out, doing science can be tough. Experience teaches us that lots of things that don't work, that things outside our control go awry, and we are left to figure out another plan, what Jordan calls Plan B, and then to fight for Plan B. Success in science requires courage and strength of character that holds steady despite turmoil. That Jordan has those qualities as well as her talent have become evident throughout her graduate career. She reclaimed her time. And as a consequence, we are here today to listen to her describe her thesis work in the human <laughs> and thank you all for showing up today. I'm excited to tell you about the work that I've been doing these past few years, studying the function of a gene called PHF6, and the scientific journey that led to us defining our role for PHF6 and modulating the chromosome protein in B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But before I go into that, I'm going to take you all the way back to square one and talk about cancer. So cancer results from the uncontrolled proliferation or growth of cells. Uh, so when you envision cancer, you may you may think of this mass of cancer cells uh, in a specific uh, organ, like a lung tumor or a brain tumor. And this is what we consider to be solid cancers. Yet there's another type of cancer called a liquid cancer that arises from uh, cells of the blood, also called hematopoietic malignancies. There are three main types of hematopoietic malignancies, lymphomas, myelomas, and leukemia. Lymphomas are actually solid tumors of the lymphatic system, where myelomas and leukemias are these circulating or liquid tumors. The HEMA lab focuses on leukemia. There are four main types of leukemia, and I specifically study acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which can be further broken down based on the cell of origin, be that a B cell or a T cell, that gives rise to B cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia or T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia which I'll refer to as EALL and TALL throughout this presentation. The focus of my thesis has been on studying PHF6 and B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Now, B-cells and T-cells, as well as all cell lineages in the blood, develop from a hematopoietic stem cell through a stepwise developmental process called hematopoiesis. Shown here is a very simplified version of just half of hematopoiesis, specifically lymphopoiesis, which depicts the development of mature B cells and T cells from a hematopoietic stem cell. Just to review, B cells are responsible for producing antibodies, whereas T cells are responsible for eliminating unhealthy cells in your body, say a cell that's been affected by a virus. Now, hematopoiesis is driven by the new specific transcription factors that drive transcriptional programs. Shown here are transcription factors important for B and T cell development. Now, leukemia often arises when you disrupt these lineage-specific transcriptional programs. Uh, this is often accomplished through the mutation or deletion of these lineage-specific transcription factors, and this leads to a block in differentiation, which is a hallmark of tumor genesis for leukemia. Um, so, immature B cells, or T cells, are often called lipoblasts or blasts. And within the bone marrow of a healthy individual, they make up less than 5% of those cells, as shown here, uh, the the blasts are seen purple. 
when B and T cell leukemia develop, they completely overtake a patient's bone marrow and blood, as you can see by these the ALL and T ALL uh, biopsies. Um, now, B cell leukemia and T cell leukemia, they both are uh, comprised of acute lymphoblastic leukemia family of hematopoietic malignancies, but they're actually very distinct tumor types. And they have distinct mutational profiles, as shown here, as well as often have different treatment strategies and practices. I specifically study uh, B-cell leukemia that's driven by the BCR-ABLE oncogene. So BCR-ABLE is the result of a reciprocal translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22. And this leads to the constitutive activation of receptor tyrosine, or of tyrosine kinase. Um, in order to study BCR-ABLE-driven B-cell leukemia, we make use of a transplantable mouse model that was developed by Williams and Scherr. Briefly, the way that they produced this model was they took the bone marrow from mice that were depleted in tumor suppressor bar. Subsequently, uh, transduced these cells with the human P190 isoform of BCR able. And um, grew these cells under conditions that selected for the outgrowth of a B cell precursor called a pre B cell. These leukemia cells can then be transplanted back into immunocompetent and genetic recipients. And this gives rise to an aggressive disseminated leukemia in less than two weeks, as shown here by luminescent imaging of mice that have been transplanted by, uh, with these cells, in which you see this disseminated disease um, by day 13. There are a few key features of this model that I would like to highlight. The first being that it closely recapitulates what we see in the clinic with human B cell leukemia. Next, the majority of cells contribute to disease, meaning that they have leukemia initiating potential and that these cells can be manipulated ex vivo before transplantation. You can study how these manipulations affect certain processes like leukemia progression or response to a certain cancer therapy. And all of these features may be great for screening purposes. And that's exactly what a former graduate student in the lab, Corbin Beecham, did. She performed parallel in vitro and in vivo screens using a genome-wide SHRNA library. And she was interested in identifying in vivo specific modulators of leukemia progression. And one of these uh, in vivo specific hits was a gene called PHS6, or plant homeodominated finger protein 6, which is a gene that's located on the X chromosome. Now, to validate um, hits from a screen in the human lab, we often use an assay called a GFP competition assay. In this, in this experiment, you directly compare the growth of cell heroin containing cells to non heroin containing cells within the same cell population. So when you perform um, a GFP competition assay for PHF6, uh, briefly what you do is you have a GFP tag vector with a heroin targeting your genetic interest, in this case PHF6. You partially transduce uh, a population of cells such that 50% um, contain the heroin, and then you can either keep these in culture or inject them into mice, and upon morbidity, use the uh, frequency of GFP positivity as a proxy for cellular fitness. Um, so when you perform this for PHF6, what you find is that PHF6 heroin containing cells deplete only in the in vivo context. And what this shows to us, as you can see here, with three different heroin against PHF6. And what this shows is that loss of PHF6 expression is detrimental to leukemia cell growth only in the in vivo context. We wanted to follow up on PHF6 for um, a variety of reasons. First being that it's it's found to be mutated in a variety of contexts. Uh, so the gene was actually first discovered and characterized because germline mutations in PHF6 uh, were found to cause an intellectual disability disorder called Borgeson Horstman Langdon syndrome, or BFLS. Then in 2002, it was found that a significant subset of T cell leukemia patients, as well as some acute myeloid leukemia patients, had loss of function mutations in PHS6, um, and that uh, approximately 38% of TALs and 3% of AMLs have these loss of function mutations, which is, suggests that loss of PHS6 is actually advantageous to TALL and uh, AML cell growth. Then, in 2015, the human lab public, the human lab specifically Corbett published, published her results showing that loss of PHS6 is detrimental to B cell leukemia growth. Along with this, we never observe any mutations of PHF6 in B cell leukemia patients. And this highlights that PHF6 appears to be acting in a tumor essential role in B cell leukemia, but as a tumor suppressor in T cell leukemia. 
there are a few documented functions of pathogenesis. We know that it, it localizes to the nucleus and the nucleolus, and that the protein contains two atypical and elongated PhD domains. PhD domains canonically bind and recognize um, histone marks, specifically H3K4 trimethyl, except these atypical and elongated PhD domains that are found in PHF6 are completely unique to this protein, has no homology to anything else, and um, it's and it's basically an uncharacterized domain. Now, a few different labs at around 2012 were interested in studying the function of PHF6, and through IP mass spec analysis, they found that PHF6 associated with um, multi-protein complexes that had described roles in the process of gene expression regulation. So gene expression is regulated, it's a regulated on multiple levels, the first being modulation of uh, chromatin accessibility to cis regulatory factors. Um, and this is often achieved through epigenetic mechanisms uh, like the modification of histone tails. So compact repressed chromatin harbors in our H3P27 trimethyl, where open and accessible chromatin have active marks H3P27 acetyl or H3P27. Accessible chromatin allows for the binding of transcription factors. Uh, and transcription factors are proteins that recognize specific sequences in the DNA and drive expression of their target genes. Transcription factors, as well as other um, proteins that are involved in uh, binding chromatin in DNA have, have specific uh, protein domains. The PhD domain, as I mentioned earlier, often recognizes a signal H3K4 channel. Um, the derivatives of this domain uh, bind uh, a variety of marks, showing that it is a very flexible domain. Um, as I mentioned to, or alluded to earlier, PHF6 is involved in multi-protein complexes that have well-described roles in each of these processes. Uh, this includes the nucleosome redomily and deacetylation complex, the PATH1 transcriptional elongation complex, as well as the uh, RDNA transcription factor UPT path. So we decided we wanted to follow up on the, the role of PHF6 and BALL uh, B specifically. It's been implicated as having a role in general um, gene expression regulation, except the function in the lipoid context was completely unexplored. Uh, we were also um, intrigued by the uh, lineage um, uh, specific or context specific roles that PHF6 appeared to be having in which it was tumor essential of BALL and uh, appears to act as a tumor suppressor in um, a great subset of, of T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients. Throughout this presentation, I will discuss our efforts in characterizing the disease states upon loss of PHF6, as well as the change that we see at the level of gene expression. Um, and how we went about um, defining a role for PHS and uh, its capacity um, as a regulator of gene expression. Further, the, um, we interrogated the changes that happened to the company landscape upon loss of PHS and how all of this translates to um, the response to different cancer therapies. From Corbin's uh, RNAi work, we know that loss of PHS expression is detrimental to people. B cell leukemia drug. We wanted to take this further, uh, one step further, so we generated PHS6 knockout isogenic cell lines using CRISPR Cas9 technique. When you inject or transplant B cells into immune complement free sitting mice, um, shown, shown here is the Kaplan survival curve of the uh, results for survival analysis of when you inject B cells into uh, immune complement mice. So shown here are mice transplanted with PHS6 wild type cells. And uh, shown here is my subjective PHF6 knockout cells. Throughout the rest of this presentation, blue will represent data from PHF6 wild type uh, mice, and red will represent PHF6 knockout data. So the first thing that you notice is upon transplant with PHF6 knockout cells, you see this uh, significant delay in leukemia onset. We decrease, oh, and this, and this uh, to us, this represented that loss of PHF6 decreased causes a decrease in cellular fitness, and this is consistent with what we saw from Corbin's data. When you decrease the number of cells that you transplant by a thousandfold, mice or uh, PHS6 wild type leukemia bearing mice all sequence the disease by day 20. However, PHS6 knockout leukemia bearing 
mice um, fail to develop a detectable leukemia and induce disease for very long time. So in addition, this also shows that loss of pH enzymes resulted in reduced leukemia and initiated infection. Upon morbidity, mice injected with wild type or knockout cells presented with vastly different diseases. So pH of six wild type leukemia very mice reprodu reproducibly present with a uh, complete infiltration to the bone marrow, the blood, as well as an enlarged spleen. Now, upon morbidity, pH of six knockout leukemia very mice present with these grossly enlarged lymph nodes, as you can see pictured here and quantified here. And also this is associated with a decrease in spleen burden and almost a um, complete ablation of PHFC knockout cells from the blood as seen here. We next wanted to ask, are there other, any, any other differences that we are observing in the natural ontology of these diseases? So um, first we noticed that loss of PHF6 uh, it appeared that you, from a disseminated um, leukemia that are switching to a more solid lymphomatic disease. Uh, in order to then take this one step further, we performed immunophenotyping experiments against a panel of hematopoietic surface markers and, um, oh, from cells isolated from the bone marrow and the lymph node. As you would expect, PHF6 wild type leukemia cells express the these markers B220 and CD19. Knockout cells have a modest but significant reduction in the expression of these B cell markers. And then strikingly, PHF6 knockout cells now express a T cell marker CD4, showing that a significant subset of the population now express both B cell markers and T cell markers. Um, in addition, it should be noted that when we exogenously express PHF6 cDNA in our knockout cells, that this rescues the um, disease latency that we observed earlier and also significantly decrease, decreases CD4 levels. We then were asked, we then asked ourselves, are there any differences at the level of gene expression? To do this, we performed RNA-seq of our wild type and knockout cells. Shown here is pairwise differential expression analysis. And what you can see is that PHF6 knockout cells have a distinct genome from PHF6 wild type. Further, what is noticeable is that the vast majority of cells or of genes that are becoming uh, differentially, um, their expression is differentially regulated after a knockout of PHF6, that the vast majority are becoming downregulated, as you can see quantified here, and as you can appreciate from this large block of blue, which represents downregulation in the feedback. When we perform GO analysis, we find that these differentially expressed genes are involved in processes. Uh, such as development and differentiation as well as cellular function of clinical sites. When we perform, uh, when we perform gene set enrichment analysis uh, on our genes that are significantly downregulated, we find enrichment of these genes and pathways that are important for B cell development, as well as um, uh, B cell signaling pathways like NFKB, BCR8, uh, as well as SNAP5, also depicted here in, the, in these GSK plots. We performed independent component analysis on our RNA-C data. An independent component analysis um, is a, it's a blind source separation analysis that is used to reduce noise and pull out uh, significantly changing uh, gene signatures. So we, I, we identified a PHF6 knockout specific signature. And when we perform gene set enrichment analysis on the ISK signature, we find that there's an enrichment of genes that are involved in pathways before we receive more positive T. Again, shown here in this We wanted to take this one step further and actually compare the transcriptomes of these wild type of knockout cells to all hematopoietic subsets in a more broader sense. Um, when we did this through principal component analysis, um, as shown here, in which each, um, each dot represents RNA seq data from a specific hematopoietic cell subset. Uh, and blue circle is the transcriptomes of our PHF6 wild type cells. And in red is a transcriptome of our PHF6 knockout cells. Below that, you can see in this blue and purple cluster are the transcriptomes of stem cell, B cell progenitors, and T cell progenitors, showing that these uh, cell subsets cluster together and are similar in their um, uh, gene expression. Up in the upper left, you see the clustering of macrophage cell subsets. And then just below that, in this orange cluster, uh, represents the clustering of mature B cells in 
all the way to the right, and that's right on the true T cell. And what you can appreciate is that PHS6 knockout cells, their transcriptomes move from clustering next to this mature B cell subset to the mature T cell subset. So, so far I've shown you that loss of PHS6 results in changes in the natural disease ontology, and which disseminated uh, leukemia turns into a more solid lymphoma like skin. This is associated with PHS6 knockout cells expressing the T cell marker CD4, as well as down regulation of the cell transcriptional program. We also observe a shift in the uh, transcriptional state to more of a T cell like state. We were intrigued to, to study how PHS6 was actually contributing to the process of gene expression regulation. And we believed that. Um, PHS6 could be exerting this control in one of two ways, either as, as acting as a novel B cell transcription factor uh, and binding in a sequence specific manner, or exerting its effect through interaction with uh, chromatin. We decided to uh, interrogate this first option by performing chip seek analysis um, of PHS6 in several histone marks. What we found is that PHS6 binds to the promoters and G bodies of many annotated genes. And um, that those differentially expressed genes have a more than twofold enrichment of PHS6 binding at their transcription start site. Additionally, we see an enrichment of PHS6 binding within uh, the gene bodies of locally expressed genes and differentially expressed genes. And this suggested to us that perhaps the genomic location of PHS6 binding had some influence on the transcriptional output of those genes. In order to study if PHS6 was binding in a sequence specific manner, we performed de novo motif analysis on the uh, promoters of uh, our differentially expressed genes. And what we found with this analysis is shown here in this table. And um, we were somewhat disappointed because at this point we thought that PHS6 was, was this new and exciting novel B cell transcription factor. But upon this analysis, we found well, PHS6 actually doesn't have a specific motif. It's not really recognizing a certain site in the genome, but rather binding more broadly. And further, it has a lack of sequence specificity. So we weren't deterred at this point. We thought, well, perhaps PHS6 is binding in a transcription factor complex, and this DNA um, specificity is conferred through other transcription factors. In order to test this, we took uh, the promoters of our differentially expressed genes that also had a high PHS6 signal, and then took plus and minus one PD segments and performed motif enrichment analysis on the segment. We found um, 28 motifs that corresponded to 24 unique transcription factors, a few of which are listed here. And what was we what was interesting about this analysis is we found that these transcription factors had defined roles in hematopoiesis. Uh, and these transcription factors include TCF1, TCF3, and a capital B, TCF12 as well. We wanted to take this one step further and uh, investigate if PHF6 actually associated with these transcription factors in uh, a complex. So we performed uh, endogenous co immunoprecipitation uh, experiments and did indeed confirm an interaction between PHF6 and TCF12 as well as that capital. Now these associations can happen in one of two ways. They can be DNA dependent or DNA independent. In a DNA dependent association, uh, your, your uh, proteins can bind to the same segment of DNA, but not actually interact. So when you pull down your protein of interest, you also pull down that DNA and any of other proteins that are associated with that DNA. In a DNA independent interaction, it's a true protein-protein association. And the way that you distinguish between these two possibilities is by the simple addition of the thidium bromide to your uh, lysines. So we, report, we repeated our co ip experiments in the presence of thidium bromide. What we found out is that thidium bromide interfered with this association, suggesting that PHS6 is indeed binding or associating with these transcription factors in a DNA dependent manner, and that it was, it's not actually binding in transcription factor complex as we thought before. So just to quickly summarize, our chip seek data led to um, us discovering that PHS6 really has no DNA sequence specificity. It's not binding on transcription factor complex, um, but instead having these DNA dependent interactions 
um, as well as just binding to segments of the genome that are rich, rich for transcription factor binding um, that is important for hematopoiesis. And through a set of experiments that I don't have time to show you right now, we try to modulate the expression of these transcription factors to see if it would rescue um, the effects that we were seeing upon loss of agentics. The overexpression of TCF12 or NF kappa B did not rescue the disease latency or the levels of CD4 that we had observed in front of them. So um, the first option in which PHF6 is as acting as a <coughs> transcription factor did not pan out. So we turned our attention to is PHF6 interacting with uh, chromatin or histones directly. If we go back to our chip seek data, what we can see is that PHF6 actually has a very similar body profile to histones themselves. Shown here is uh, H3K27 acetyl, H3K27 acetylation signal, uh, which is a histone post translational modification and a marker of active DNA. And what you can see is a nice enrichment of H3K27 signal that flanks the transcription start site, which corresponds to the uh, plus one and minus one region. When we rank PHS6 binding based on gene expression, we see that a highly expressed genes, there's a very similar binding profile that PHS6 has that's very similar to H3K27 as well. We, this led us to hypothesize that this similar binding pattern may mean that PHS6 is actually interacting with, uh, with histone proteins directly. And then finally, we noticed that PHS6 appeared to have a very different uh, binding profile at lowly expression which is localized at the transcription start site at lowly expression, but flanking the transcription start site um, at highly expression. We also see a positive correlation of PHF6 binding with the other active marker of activation, H3K1 trimethyl, where it has a low to no correlation between the repressive mark, H3K27 trimethyl. We are able to confirm a strong interaction between PHF6 and histone H3. And in addition, this uh, interaction is independent of the, um, uh, is DNA independent, meaning that it is a true protein protein interaction as there is still uh, a conservation of the interaction upon uh, addition of the bromides. So to summarize that part, we show that PHF6 uh, is not acting as a chemical transcription factor or a transcription factor complex. We instead make direct protein protein interactions with histone protein. Going back to our experimental roadmap, <coughs> we've shown that knockout of PHF6 uh, distinctly changes um, the disease states as well as uh, the levels of gene expression, and that this is mediated through direct interactions with uh, histone protein. We want to take this one step further and interrogate if there were any changes in the chromosome landscape upon loss of PHS6. In order to do this, we performed uh, an experiment called ATAXI. And ATAXI stands for Assay for Transposase Accessible Chromatin. And it's a method used for mapping genome-wide chromatin accessibility. Briefly, it uses a hyperactive transposase, which simultaneously fragments regions of open chromatin um, as well as the tags them with sequencing adapters, which you can then sequence and infer chromatin accessibility in the blue cell conditioning. Uh, so, attack, in, um, attack seek, low signal corresponds to regions of um, repressed closed chromatin, which the transposase cannot access, and regions of high attack signal uh, or places that are actually being sequenced represent open and permissive. When we perform a taxi on our biotype in knockout cells, what we find is that there's uh, about approximately 700 uh, genomic loci that are undergoing significant changes in chromatin accessibility. Uh, whereas our RNAC data shows that the majority of differentially expressed genes is downregulated, we see that the chromatin is changing in both directions, going from a closed, repressed state to a, an open. Uh, or sorry, I have the backwards, to an open state to a closed state, or vice versa, a closed repressed state to a more permissive state. You can take the regions of DNA that are experiencing dramatic shifts in chromatin accessibility and perform uh, motif enrichment analysis. When we look at regions that are going from open to closed, 
we find that there's a, an enrichment of transcription factor binding sites um, of transcription factors that are for for B cell development. If you look the other way and you look at regions that are going from a closed to an open state, you find an enrichment of transcription factors that are important for T cell development, as well as implicated in uh, T cell leukemia and uh, AO. Um, so, uh, in addition to just looking at chromatin accessibility, you can use a taxi and actually map nucleosome positions. Shown here is the nucleosome positions in a metagene plot of uh, PHSH wild type cells shown in um, a solid line. And PHS6 knockout cells shown in this dotted line. And so, this type of graph, what this represents is um, here at this, uh, this low peak in the signal, this represents the nucleosome free region, which is characteristic of the transcription start site. The peaks that we observe um, to that flank this nucleosome free region correspond to the plus and minus length of the Due to the lineage fluidity that we were observing upon loss of PHSAs, we decided to focus our nucleosome positioning analysis on lineage-specific gene sets. And we utilized two pre-curated lists of genes that were unique to CD19-positive B cells and CD4-positive T cells. Before we look at the nucleosome positions in those gene sets, quickly what you'll be seeing is at the top is the nucleosome positions, and at the bottom is our chip seq binding profile of PHSAs. So when we look globally at all genes, what we can see is there's really no, not many differences between PHS6 wild type and PHS6 knockout nucleosome positions at, at the global level. If we turn our attention to genes that are important for CD19 B cells, what we, what we see is that there is a global increase in nucleosome um, occupancy at these B cell specific genes. And we see this at the transcription start site, as well as the minus one plus one nucleosomes and within the gene body. Um, as you can tell by this uh, shift upward from the dotted line, which corresponds to increased nucleosome occupancy in PHS6 knockout cells. In addition, these, these uh, locations that are significantly changing upon loss of PHS6 are enriched for PHS6 binding, suggesting that you lose PHS6 at these uh, B cell specific genes that this results in an increase in nucleosome occupancy. <coughs> and we can see this, um, this result at the level of gene expression, in which you see down regulation of cell specific genes. When we turn our attention to CD4 positive T cells, we see that uh, in this gene set, there is a depletion of nucleosome, um, a shifting away from the transcription start site, as well as depleting from the minus one nucleosome which is characteristic of, uh, of promoters that are undergoing increased chromatin accessibility, um, in which you see preferential depletion of nucleosomes um, at the minus one nucleosome spot. Again, we see that these positions that are changing upon um, loss of PHS6 are enriched for PHS6 binding sites. So through our taxi data, we showed that um, Regions with DNA that are undergoing increased or decreased uh, chromatin accessibility are rich for B cell and T cell transcription factor binding sites. Further, we show that um, we, ex we observe major changes in nucleosome positions at these B cell and T cell specific genes, and that these changes overlap with the HS6 binding. This led us to um, think more critically about the changes that we were seeing at T cell transcription factor binding sites, um, and let us to postulate that perhaps this permissive chromatin landscape around these T cell specific genes would allow for T cell transcription factors to bind and um, drive T cell programs. So just to reiterate, in PHS6 block type cells, you see that um, T cell transcription factor binding motifs are found in closed compact chromatin. And this is a common mechanism in order to request the T cell rate. Upon knockout of PHS6, you see an increase in chromatin accessibility at these transcription factor binding sites. And therefore, we wanted to test if a T cell transcription factor could bind its cognate motif and drive um, a T cell program. 
they're interested in one T cell transcription factor in particular, and that is NOTCH1. So NOTCH1 is the main driver of T cell development, as well as activating mutations in NOTCH1 drive the vast majority of T cell mutations. We also know that PHF6 mutant T ALLs have a significant association with mutations in NOTCH1, which about 80% of PHF6 mutant T ALLs also have uh, activating mutations in NOTCH1. So we therefore wanted to test the effects of overexpression expression NOTCH1 in our wild type and knockout cells. We used a constitutively active form of NOTCH1 called the NOTCH1 intracellular domain, which we shortened to NICD um, in, this, in the next data. So, when, so uh, NOTCH1 signaling is actually toxic to B cells normally, and that's what we observed upon overexpression of NOTCH in our PHS wild type cell, in which these cells are now no longer viable. However, upon notch overexpression in PHS6 knockout cells, these are not only viable, but they have equivalent growth rates as our vector control subline. When you inject these into immunocombinant syngenate recipients, what you find is that PHS6 knockout cells that overexpress notch give rise to a latent lymphoma, and that, it, um, and that this disease would, presents with extensive binding infiltration as quantified here. So much so that when um, these mice succumb to disease, the rib cage, which houses the thymus, the lungs, and the heart, are completely overtaken with thymic tissue and it's filled with blood fluid that is that is made up entirely of these uh, knockout plus notch uh, leukemia cells. Also, overexpression of notch results in a significant increase in the expression of C4 on our PHS6 knockout cell. Uh, demonstrating that notch overexpression pushes our T cell knock or PHF6 knockout cells more into a T cell -like state. So what we just discussed is that the changes that we're seeing in chromatin accessibility with increases um, uh, in chromatin uh, accessibility at T cell transcription factor binding sites actually functional, functionally allows for a T cell transcription to um, hijack the BAL genome and push it more into a T cell like or a T ALL state. Now you can't get very far in the human lab without asking uh, how does this affect the response to cancer therapies? Um, BALs and T ALs, uh, specifically BCR able driven malignancies, have different treatment strategies. Um, so uh, Oftentimes, they are a B cell, a B driven B cell leukemia is treated with an inhibitor of the CR able, like imatinib, statinib, or pinatinib. And pinatinib is a third generation B cell inhibitor. Whereas T cell leukemias um, are often treated with multi drug chemotherapy regimens. Uh, so we, we next decided to look at the response of wild type and not bad malignancies to uh, these two different. Um, uh, therapies. We first looked at the response to pinatinib. So if you look at uh, global gene expression analysis, what you see is that there is um, a downregulation of genes, genes whose expression is important to PCR in the same way, uh, demonstrating that we observe decreased dependence on the driving oncogenes PCR able and our PHS6 knockout cells. Shown here is another Captain survival analysis, but this time um, depicting PHS6 wild type and knockout mice that have been treated with control. And again, what you can see is you see uh, observe this characteristic um, disease latency of one knockout of PHS6. Now, when you treat PHS6 wild type leukemia bearing mice with pinatinib, they have astounding and durable responses to this PCR inhibitor. inhibitor. Uh, the way that we perform this experiment is that um, we have a four-day treatment course using pinatinib um, as soon as the mice present with significant disease burden. And after administration of the first dose, you see a complete change in the health of these mice. They go from being very sick to running around 24 hours after you administer the first dose. Um, and so we see an average or greater than a 50-day extension of survival upon treatment with pinatinib with the majority of mice still running around and up in the mouse house today. When you treat PHS6 knockout leukemia-bearing mice, 
you find that there is a complete difference in the response of these mice to this drug. So you all see there's, uh, there's actually like a complete no response to adaptive treatment with mice dying during the four day treatment course. And the majority is coming to this is by day 15. Showing that PHS is not gut disease is resistant to penaptive treatment. We then decided to focus our um, studies on the response of these malignancies to Dr. Dr. Rubison is part of the um, intense chemotherapy regimen Hydrocevac, uh, and it, it's a general chemotherapeutic agent that is the DNA interpreter. Again, shown here is the capital balance with minor survival curve of mice that were treated with um, vehicle. Now, when you treat PHF6 wild type leukemia very mice with Dr. Rubison, you do see an, a significant increase in survival. When you when you treat PHS6 knockout leukemia very mice, you observe a, a very significant increase in survival with these mice um, having astounding uh, responses to this drug, with an average um, increase, 15 day increase in median survival. So you are essentially doubling the lifespan of these mice, which is incredible in our model that, uh, that uh, is so quick and aggressive which the majority of mice naturally succumb to the disease in less than two weeks, you see a significant extension in survival. When you look at um, the location of leukemia cells upon morbidity, what you find is that PHS6 wild type leukemia bearing mice have cells that persist in the bone marrow, the lymph nodes, and the thymus, whereas PHS6 knockout leukemia bearing mice have cells that persist exclusively in the thymus. Previously, Luke Gilbert and Hina have shown that the thymus is a chemoprotective environment for bona fide bone cells that are treated with oxyrubicin. Again, highlighting that the PHS is not out malignancy has characteristics of um, a bona fide uh, malignancy. Through a set of experiments that I don't have time to show you today, we investigated whether this increase in sensitivity to doxorubicin is actually due to a global increase in chromatin accessibility that would allow this DNA interpolator to um, function, uh, uh, to have a more um, potent effect in these cells. Um, however, we found that this was not the case, and again reflected that what we are observing is at the level of differential response to these therapies um, is due to a shift in the disease. So just to summarize, again, what we see is that PHS6 knockout tumors are resistant to phenatinib and sensitive to doxorubicin. Going back to our experimental roadmap, what we've talked about throughout this presentation is that loss of PHS6 results in significant changes to the natural disease oncology of these malignancies, as well as major changes at, at the level of gene expression. We also see um, that the chromatin landscape undergoes focal changes at B cell and T cell specific genes, and that PHF6 have, is contributing to this process by direct interaction with histone protein. That this all translates to um, really incredible uh, differential responses to phenatinib or doxorubicin um, in vivo. What I'm showing you today is that PHS6 binds <coughs> to specific genomic locations and that it coordinates, coordinates chromatin accessibility at these, uh, at these segments in the DNA, and that this is reflected um, at the level of gene expression. We see that PHS6 binds and coordinates um, or stabilizes chromatin accessibility at B cell specific genes, and then at T cell genes and T cell uh, transcription factor binding sites. It coordinates the compaction um, uh, of the chromatin at sites important for T cells. When you lose PHS6, we observe dramatic remodeling of the chromatin architecture at these B cell and T cell specific genes. But this is reflected at the level of um, as small as gene expression to as big as the response to different therapies. And that this modulation of the chromatin landscape imparts lineage plasticity to our B cell and Throughout all of this, we still had this paradigm in our mind. We are still intrigued by this question. Why is PHF6 acting as a tumor essential in DNA levels, but a tumor suppressor in TNA levels? 
What we've shown you is that loss of PHS6 is detrimental to B cell leukemia growth. Uh, what we've also discovered is that loss of PHS6 results in lineage plasticity from, the B, from B cells to a more T cell like state. Um, and this is done through dysregulation of the chromosome We therefore postulated that the, a significant subset of T cell leukemias, specifically 38%, or those that are mutant in PHF6, may have once actually originated as a B cell precursor. And that's why you do not ever notice that PHF or ever observe mutations in B cell leukemia when you do in T cell. So you can imagine that you have a B-cell precursor, and that this B-cell precursor obtains a mutation in PHS6, specifically a loss of function mutation. That this imparts not only lineage plasticity and loss of cell identity, but that you see these changes in the chromatin landscape, specifically um, increases in chromatin accessibility at T-cell transcription factor microphone. You can also imagine that this B-cell precursor may also acquire an activating mutation in a T-cell transcription let's say NOTCH1, and that NOTCH1 can now bind its motifs in this B cell precursor, um, in this B cell precursor genome and drive and hijack this cell and, and drive it more towards the T cell like state. And upon complete tumor adjustment, you see that this actually presents as a T cell leukemia. This regulation of the chromatin landscape has become more appreciated within the past year. Uh, as having significant contributions to a variety of cancer processes, including tumor progression and lineage progression, as well as metastasis. And um, we're also observing uh, this novel mechanism of resistance to targeting therapies in a variety of contexts. <coughs> so what we've shown you is that loss of PHS6 is detrimental to B cell leukemia growth, and that loss of PHS6 results in um, dramatic changes of the chromatin landscape at B cell and T cell specific gene. And that this contributes not only to, uh, it's detrimental to B cell tumor progression, but also results in lineage conversion. Monty Lin Winslow's lab has recently shown that a global increase in chromatin accessibility, which is mediated by a, trans by a factor called NFIB, actually promotes metastasis in lung. Now, in the clinic, we are seeing that a variety of tumor types are um, relapsing uh, to upon treatment of targeted therapies by switching to a different lineage. Um, so we see this in lung cancers that are treated with EGFR inhibitors. We see this in prostate cancers, which are treated with anti-androgen inhibitors. And we also see this in B-cell leukemias that are treated with CD19-directed CAR-T therapy. Um, and just to expand, when these B-cell leukemias are treated with this CAR-T therapy, um, a subset of patients are relapsing by losing CD19 expression and now expressing markers of the myelinated lineage, um, which is similar to an acute myelinated There are three things, um, or three important implications that I would just like to highlight now. The first is that lineage switching appears to be a novel mechanism of resistance and many different resistance in many different tumors. And just here are shown lung, prostate, and some leukemia. So the more that we discover and learn about different cancer types, the more that we can identify novel therapeutic targets. And we can develop targeted therapies to those targets. And what we see, we're seeing in the clinic is that one mechanism of resistance is through lineage switching to targeted therapy. What we've shown throughout this presentation is that dysregulation of the chromatin landscape is May, it's a huge contributor to lineage conversion, and that this may very well underline this process of uh, lineage conversion that we're seeing in the clinic. Therefore, more effort and study needs to be focused on this process of lineage switching so that we can therapeutically restrict the ability of these cancer cells to switch lineages and therefore inhibit this, this mechanism of relapse. But I'd just like to highlight that this, this is clinically relevant right now in which um, the treatment of B cell leukemia with CD19 CAR T therapy was approved by the FDA um, in just a little under a month ago. So um, these patients that uh, develop B ALL and are treated with CD19 CAR T therapy, they are having strong germinal responses, but a subset of patients are relapsing through this lineage switch mechanism. 
and um, actually succumbing to disease. And um, just to end, what we've shown you is that through our studies with PHL6 in BAL, we've shown that the chromatin landscape or dysregulation of the chromatin landscape is a huge contributor to this process of lending to conversion. And further, that PHL6, uh, we have defined a role for PHL6 and modulating the chromatin and described how loss of this gene has huge implications um, in B cell identity and um, uh, response to different therapies. And with that, I have a lot of people that I would like to thank. Well, if you know me, I'm a fire, so start taking, <laughs> start taking bets right now on how our thing So, first and foremost, I would like to thank. My scientific advisors, uh, Mike, Jackie, Tyler, and Scott. Um, so, a lot of the experiments that I showed you today came as a result of conversations that I had with both of them, uh, which resulted in, hey, did you try this? Or, um, this kind of looks like what I see over there. Go look into that for a bit. So, this project, the paper, as well as my thesis would not be where it is today without all of this. Uh, I would also like to thank Scott for coming here today and serving as my counselor. The Human Lab. Um, so the Human Lab is not just my co-workers. They are my lab family. Susie, Ian Pong, Sylvia, Faye, Christian, Louise, Simona, and Mana. Uh, oh, it's going to get to me. <laughs> <laughs> so there are no other people in my life that I would like to share those crazy long nights of work, the snack box, the triumphs, the tribulations, birthdays, holidays, and every day. You guys constantly amaze me. No, excuse me. But your intelligence, your work ethic, your courage, your spirit, and your support. <laughs> I wouldn't be here without you all. Okay. What are we going to happen? Okay, um, I have I owe a huge thank you to Team PHF6. This project was the result of close collaboration with former graduate student here, Yudhir Sonokuliana, as well as um, the current graduate student, Ian Paul. And you Paul are just like you say that, so we can all acknowledge you. <laughs> I have so much gratitude for these people for their hard work, their effort, their passion. And the time that both of you have dedicated to this project to study PHS6. I wouldn't be here, and this project wouldn't be here today without both of you, and I'm so proud of how it turned out. Also, on Team PHS6, uh, I need to thank Dave, who and his efforts and help with the Gypsy experiments, AJ with his um, help with RNA seq analysis, as well as Jason and Christine from Extend New Farm from the Forget Lab. Um, for their work on uh, the attack seek. Um, I would also like to thank the tax facility uh, and the many borrowed memories of the late, late, late nights spent in the tax facility, as well as the Whitehead Genome Sequencing Corps and my funding. And I would also like to thank the Lee's Lab for their help in this final stretch in getting, them, in getting the paper out and celebrating with me and supporting me and being there um, through everything we've done. Biograd 2015. As you can see, they showed up in full force in their pink shirts. <laughs> um, I was so fortunate to be part of MIT's Biograd class of 2013. Let me tell you, these four years have been one for the books. From the very first night when they met me at a barbecue. <laughs> 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 they welcomed me with open arms, as well as celebrated with me um, from the pit parties to shotgun season to hockey balls <laughs> to pit prom to flip cup turn up, uh, as well as playing on parties. I got a group of wonderful and brilliant scientists that I'm grateful to know and call them friends. I would also like to shout out that our, um, where is the picture? Show here our pit prom king and queen. <laughs> 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 
Now there's a word guidance, guidance and care. There are crusaders that constantly remind me to like to deal with whoever turns in the book. It's like never judges me when I don't cry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so they see what's on the bottom of the paper. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I apologize if I missed this, but in the humans that did you say there's humans with yeah, yeah. Um, any of those have may not have been looked at, but skewing of B or T cell lineages. Right, uh, so I'm glad that you asked that question because it's not thing. Yes, we were intrigued by that exact question. Um, so these these patients, these BFLS patients that have these germline mutations, um, they do not have any reported hematopoietic deficits, and uh, they they are predisposed to cancer. Um, there are two instances in which these BFLS patients, one developed uh, a non Hodgkin's lymphoma and one a T cell leukemia. Um, so we decided to actually study this further, and we know that wild type HSHCD and rescues um, are in vivo phenotypes. Um, so we generated HSH knockout or um, a BFLS mutant uh, form of HSHCD. And I observed the same thing in which. Uh, BFLS mutants, and rescues the disease latency and also the level of CD4 expression, suggesting that these missense mutations, and that's exactly what they are, they're missense mutations in BFLS and deletions and truncations in these leukemias, that um, it appears to uh, conserve the lymphoid um, function of the patient. If there are no more questions, we'll be uh, doing the review of the fits in one hour. We will kill them for the book. Thank <laughs> you. 